Thank you. Last time I was here in DC, I had the chance to be on stage. You know what I did? I came flying, just like that. Many people have been asking me, do you still fly? The answer is yes. I fly every day and I enjoy it. And I hope today many of you will join me in this adventure. Anyway, let me tell you about my long journey to flying. When I was a young boy, my friends and I ran around and explored everything around us. We climbed trees. We went deep into the marshland and we jumped. We had a lot of fun. We'd go through the thorns, through the shrubs, just to see birds. I could tell you for hours about our adventures with birds, but today I want to tell you about one special bird, the gray crowned crane. I remember watching them when I went to collect water for my family down at the bottom of the hill at the valley. This was a highlight of my childhood. We would watch them dancing, hear them calling. I always wanted to fly like them. You can't imagine how many times I made pretend feathers so that I can fly like them. I tried to fly and I fell down, and I fell, and I fell down. I would go home with injuries and my parents would ask me, Olivier, what happened to you? But I wouldn't tell because I wanted to try again and again <laughs> and again. And because I believed anything is possible. As I was growing up, I slowly lost my hope to flying, sad. I thought I would never be able to fly like a crane. Ladies and gentlemen, my country Rwanda is so beautiful that anyone can wish to be a bird to enjoy these views. But unfortunately, my country is one of the highly populated in Africa. Densities have reached over 500 people per square kilometers. And this does not make, make it easy for conservation. On my left, this is a photo of the Volcanoes National Park. And it is, clearly shows you the line of how people have pushed with agriculture. In 94, when genocide happened in my, in my country, it ruined the country. I was nine years old. After genocide, I wanted to contribute till build, to rebuilding my country. My very first job was to be a gorilla doctor. One dream job. For the first time, I felt like I was contributing to rebuilding my country by saving a critically endangered species in my country. But guess what? I wasn't flying. My heart was not in the right place. I started exploring what was happening with the gray crown cranes. And this is what I found. With less than 500 cranes in my country, if nothing was done, we could lose all of them. So what's happening, gray crown cranes have, have been losing most of their habitat. But in addition, this is happening. There is a huge demand for pet trade. Many people want to have them in their gardens, in hotels, as pets. So local communities, driven by poverty and lack of awareness, they are hunting, poaching, and selling to those who want to have them. So cranes, when they end in captivity, people cut feathers to stop them from flying. They never make good pets. And we lose a huge number of cranes by malnutrition. People don't know how to care for them, and stress, and most, most important, these cranes, they can't breed in captivity. So we've lost, we've lost a huge number of cranes. So when I became aware of this, I told myself, I'm, I'm gone, I have to do something about it. So that's when I founded an organization to help these cranes with our ultimate goal to stop the illegal trade and remove all the captive cranes. We have been implementing a number of strategies. I can't say it all, like it's so much of activities. But today I want to tell you about one strategy. Um, it's illegal to keep cranes in, a, in, in, in a captivity in my country. But when I saw that people really love them, they want to have them, or, and they are not aware of the consequences, I decided just to go in with awareness. So we launched a media campaign. We went on radios, television, and we told the people, did you know the cranes that we love could disappear? Did you know that our grandkids, our great grandkids, might not be able to see the cranes? And the, I told them, if you really, really love cranes and you want to give the, them a second chance, let's do something about it. I opened my phone, my private phone number, to the whole country. I said, <laughs> like, 
please call me if you want to register to tell me you have a crane. So many people have been calling me voluntarily. We have registered about 288 cranes. And when we register, these people accept that we can take these cranes. So we've been taking them, confiscating them. Not confiscating them, but people have accepted. So when we take them, we put them under quarantine, health checks. And the purpose of this is to identify cranes that can have a second chance to go back to the wild. And when the quarantine is finished, this is what happens. Today we'll be hitting 100 cranes in the wild. When you see them running and some of them flying, it's a huge relief. It's worth the effort, it's worth the hard work. Cranes? They like to flock up to find food together, fly together. And every time I see them, it reminds me how, like, as human, we need to work in a team. We can't succeed with everything we are doing without working together. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for a long time, I felt like I would never be able to fly. But recently, I found something. Um, every time I release the captive cranes, I see them flying. I close my eyes and I fly with them. I can fly. But I want to tell you something good that has been happening. We've released about 156 cranes into the wild, and these constitute 30% of the whole population of cranes in my country. And this is not only the only thing that is happening. These cranes, they are coupling and they're having chicks. And this gives me the hope for the gray crown cranes in my country. Sadly, during the whole process, we've come across a huge number of cranes that are disabled. Many people have accidentally or purposefully broken the wings so that these cranes will never be able to fly. We have over 50 cranes that are in these conditions. But the good news, the government has given us use of 21 hectares in a capital city. And we want to transform this place into a crane area, a Musambi village. It's like a great crown crane village. And we want to build a huge environmental education center. We want to educate the large community in Rwanda. And this means we can achieve our goal of not having any cranes, any captivity, and we can end the trade. So if you ever want to fly, if you have ever wanted to fly, please join me. Together, we can end the trade in gray crown cranes. Together, we can give a hope to the gray crown cranes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. What an incredible story of hope. Next. Please welcome 2019 National Geographic Buffett Award for Conservation Leadership recipient, Patricia Medici. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a taper. This is a lowland taper. This is the animal I'm passionate about. This is the most incredible animal on the face of the earth. <laughs> There's, I'm not open for discussion. <laughs> this is the, the largest land mammal in South America. They can weigh up to 250 kilos. They're massive. They're gorgeous. Um, they live throughout South America in uh, 11 different countries, 21 different ecoregions, many different habitat types, forests, grasslands, uh, floodplains. They're very plastic animals. They can be found in all kinds of habitats. They're closely associated with water. Uh, they're excellent swimmers. They're fantastic swimmers. They swim super fast. They're nocturnal. They're solitary. Very, very elusive animals. Very difficult to, to see a taper in the wild. Very, very difficult. They're herbivores, 100%. 50% of their diet consists of fruit. And uh, when they eat fruit, they swallow the seeds and they disperse those seeds throughout the landscape through their feces. And they have this major, major, extremely important role in shaping and maintaining biodiversity. And for that reason, they're known as the gardeners of the forest. So if tapers go extinct, forests' habitats will be very, very different from what they are right now. Um, this is a baby taper. <laughs> the watermelon, the cutest animal offspring in the animal kingdom. <laughs> there is no competition, again, not open for discussion. Um, 
and uh, what makes tapers so charismatic. Um, it's pretty much the baby taper. So we use these pictures a lot. Um, and this is the problem. Not many people actually know what a taper is. Many people think this is a taper. <laughs> this is not a taper. This is a giant anteater. Tapers do not eat ants. They do not eat thermites. Never, ever. I told you, they eat fruit. Um, the people who do know what a taper is, uh, particularly in Brazil, they actually associate tapers with lack of intelligence. And that's a whole different problem. Because in Brazil, if you want to call somebody, let's say, stupid, uh, you will call that person a taper. It's more or less like, like here in the US, like calling somebody a jackass. Um, so that's a, that's a huge public relations problem that we, <laughs> we're trying really hard, working really hard to try. <laughs> and solve, and it's only in Brazil, and we don't really know where it comes from. We're trying to, to figure that out. Um, so since 1996, we have been working throughout the country in all the different biomes where tapers are found in Brazil. Uh, we have established research and conservation programs in the Atlantic Forest, in the Pantanal, in the Cerrado, and right now at this very moment, we're establishing our fourth and final program in the Brazilian Amazon. And we work mostly outside of protected areas and private land where we're most needed. In, um, in each one of the regions, in each one of the biomes, we identify and make assessments of all the different threats affecting tapers in that particular region, which usually includes habitat destruction. Um, road kill is a very serious problem for tapers throughout Brazil, throughout South America, pesticide contamination, and, uh, and poaching. So once we have that information, once we, we finish those assessments, we have all the data we need to design and implement uh, local strategies for their conservation in all these different regions throughout the country. And over the years, over the past 20, 23 years, we have captured, we have radio collared, we have monitored hundreds of tapers throughout the country. So we have tons, tons, and tons of information coming in every day. And uh, those pieces of information, they're extremely important to us to help us design those conservation strategies that I mentioned before, make them effective, make them realistic for each one of the different regions we're, we're dealing with. But it's not all about um, the science. Uh, at some point in, the, in our history, we realized that we were doing amazing science. We were collecting fantastic data. We were designing all these amazing conservation strategies. We were publishing. We were presenting in conferences. But we were more or less preaching to the converted. We were not talking to the public. So we decided that communication had to be a big component of the work we do in Brazil. And Brazil is huge. We have lots of people in my country. So um, a good uh, part of our energy uh, is spent communicating, talking to the general public, using all the different tools that are available out there, um, uh, social media networks, art, photography, film, um, TV, Brazilians love television, the press. We use everything we can to talk to the public um, as often as possible to spread the word about the taper conservation cause as widely as possible in Brazil mostly, but also internationally. And uh, Brazil is going through several important changes right now. I'm sure you're all aware of that. We have a new so-called president in the country. Um, and all our, our conservation environmental agencies, all our legislation, all our environmental policy, everything is being dismantled, completely dismantled by the minute as we speak. Um, and all of us, uh, conservationists in Brazil and around the world, we have to stand up for this fight. We have to speak up. We have to make sure we'll be heard throughout this process. We know it's going to be hard and painful, um, but we have to do that. And speaking for myself, all I can say is that I will keep doing uh, whatever I can. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that these animals and all the habitats where they're still found will not go extinct. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I'd love to go see a taper out there in the wild. Wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah.
So if you're joining us tomorrow night for the awards program um, uh, dinner, you'll have a chance to hear even more about Patricia, Patricia's incredible work. Our last speaker for this session is a very familiar face for many of you. We call him the Batman around here because he really is the real Batman. And he's always available to advise you on your best choice of tequila. <laughs> Join me in welcoming biologist and National Geographic explorer at large, Rodrigo Medellin. Thank you. No, I don't fly either. I do not fly. So when the National Geographic asked me to share some stories and some lessons about how to put a species on the map, I immediately started thinking, well, what map? What is the map? So this is the result of the reflections that I've been going through since they asked me. And it's a, it's a joy that I hope that I'll be able to convey some of these lessons to you all. Oops, I have to go back. Um, this situation of putting a species on the map is not an easy thing to do because you have to start from how do, you, how do you begin by finding a species? I'm gonna talk about two cases, two species, two different species. Um, when you choose a species, you don't choose the species because it's very beautiful or because it's very charismatic. In fact, most of the time, the species chooses you and they choose you by instigating passion and by posing incredible questions and fascinating challenges that you really want to get in, engaged in. And that you feel that you may have a little bit of a solution for the problems that are affecting those species. So it's really the opposite. The, the species chooses you. When you're talking about, uh, about bats, can you believe that there's people who are horrified about bats? How can that possibly be? But unfortunately, it is true. However, there's many ways in which you can turn the tide around and make people adore bats. And I'm talking about when you're talking to uh, kindergartners or senators or governors or whatever, local communities, anybody. You start talking about the ecosystem services that bats provide to you and to them and the fact that bats touch every day of your life, and then they start, uh, they start figuring out, oh yeah, bats are not that horrifying after all. This is exactly the message that we need to convey. Um, when you work on bats, you have to do a lot of research. You have to work with many maps. What are the maps that you're working on? This is just one collection of maps, but there's so many other maps. In this case, it's the federal government and the industry and the multilateral environmental agencies, but you also have to work with the local communities, with the children in the schools and so on and so forth. And each of those is one different map and you have to work on those and many other maps. So you have to put your species on all of those maps. Uh, shifting gears, let's go to the jaguar. Jaguars have a very uh, powerful and positive image already to begin with, right? People like jaguars, right? However, jaguars get in trouble very often. <laughs> they attack cattle, and that is a problem that we created ourselves because we invaded the land of the jaguar, and we put these animals in front of them, and we removed their original prey, and we're asking them not to touch our animals. Well, I'm sorry. That is a problem that we created. Um, to do this, to, to solve these problems, you have to do a lot of research. And research involving finding out what are, the, what are the movements of the animals, what is the spatial ecology, the diet of the animals. Here you can see a member of my team, Antonio de la Torre, who is probably here in the audience. I hope somewhere here. That's right, he's not here. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> But he is one of the top jaguar experts in the world, and with him we've done a lot of this work. Once you have your science in place, please, please publish. If you publish, you are going to have the respect of your peers, 
and you're going to have the credibility of science. But publishing is not all. And to paraphrase Sir Winston Churchill, publishing is not the end. Publishing is not even the beginning of the end. Publishing is the end of the beginning. We need to sit down with the, every, every group of stakeholders and work with them. Get each and every one of your lessons, digest it, and put it in their hands so that they can get your science and your findings and they can put them in their, in their everyday practices or into public policy or both. But if you don't have the science there and if you don't have the publishing there, then you don't have the credibility. You have to have both. Some of the results that we have achieved over the years in the case of the bats is number one, that bats are now stable. All of, the, all of the colonies that we've been following for the past 30 years are either stable or growing, and we have new colonies in many places. We have delisted a species of bat, and we're in the process of working towards delisting several other species of bats. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. We have achieved uh, the rooting of the outreach and education. Today, we are not the only ones. By far, we're not the only ones that are talking about bats in a positive light. There's many other people that are doing this. And this is exactly the commitment, the, the, the commitment that we want to instigate in the Mexican public and everywhere else. There's also a new generation of conservation scientists already working in their own countries, in Mexico, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, and many of the places where we've been working. So this is really putting a species on the map. In the case of the jaguars, we have a very strong program on jaguar compensation in which responsible ranchers get their money whenever a jaguar attacks a, uh, a head of cattle, if they have respected the original prey of the, of the jaguar, if they did not hunt any, any jaguars either, and if they're not deforesting. If they do that, I am very happy to report that this year we celebrated case number 400 in which the federal government of Mexico paid compensation because of these responsible ranchers that are working with us for the conservation of the jaguar. Ten years ago, we achieved the fact that Mexico became the first country in the world to have an estimate of how many jaguars do we have. And because of us doing a second national jaguar survey last year, we can now report that the jaguar population grew by 20% last year to 4,800 jaguars in all of Mexico. So that is a, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, it's putting the species on the map on a much bigger way. Um, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Being there an academic, I never dreamed that I would be working in the multilateral environmental agreements. So it took me a big effort to get out of there and start working in CITES. You have to get out of your comfort zone. We have to create and enable communities of change. We need to do that. Do not take yourself too seriously. <laughs> Don't take yourself too seriously. Come down of the ivory tower. You are just one more human being. And you can interact with everyone else. Having a PhD is absolutely nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you have to come down from the ivory tower. Work with other sectors. Reach out. If you're an academic, Work with the governments. If you're a local practitioner, work with academics, et cetera, et cetera. And never, ever give up. Thank you very much. <laughs>